Well, hello everyone, and um, we are still in Rembrandt's country in Holland, and while he was certainly the greatest, he was not alone. And today we will look at um, the environment within which he lived, and at other painters among whom he lived. Well, here we have Holland, today, today's Belgium, Luxembourg, and what happened was that historically, as a result of uh, dynastic marriages, the entire lowlands, this whole territory, came under the dominion of Spain. And uh, slightly after the middle of the 16th century, these lands rebelled against Spain. The war will last for quite a while, as a result of which Spain will retain Flanders, today's Belgium, Luxembourg, but the northern area will become independent. It will become independent by the year 1609. However, nine years later, it will again be engaged in, uh, in the wars of religion, the 30-year war that will devastate Germany. But at the end of that war, in the year 1648, Spain finally, officially, will recognize independence of Holland. And thus we have Holland now. It does not have aristocracy. The uh, Prince of Orange is mostly a military commander. And it will essentially uh, fall back on its democratic institutions. And its painters will fall onto the open market practically for the first time uh, in, the, uh, in the history of painting so far. We remember that once Calvinism uh, spread throughout Northern Europe, the churches, many churches, were denuded of their art, of their altarpieces, uh, of their, certainly of their religious art. And, uh, and one, uh, Peter Seingram, who from Amsterdam, uh, specialized in painting the interiors of these churches, uh, having really a, a lovely sense of uh, organization of planes, of light, of space, and even though coming from Italy, of course, and seeing those spectacular uh, interiors, this looks extremely stark. Nevertheless, there is, he does manage to give it a mystery of its own. And here is the um, flagstone right in the front where his father was buried. Here is another one, a uh, choir of uh, St. Brothers Church in Harlem. And this one is in Massachusetts, uh, the same sort of thing, the same sort of organization of planes. It's almost cubist, really, in its reduction to the essentials, the essential geometric forms. Uh, on the other hand, uh, one Henrik Goldsius, who is from the Utrecht school, and the Utrecht uh, for a large part, actually, there were very many Catholics there, and uh, Henrik Goldsius, in fact, spent quite a, a number of years in Italy and was very much interested and influenced uh, by Italian draftsmanship, and which we can see here, he uh, the perspectives, the uh, foreshortening is absolutely extraordinary. He brought to an unprecedented level the use of the swelling line, where the burin is manipulated to make lines thicker or thinner to create a tonal effect. Uh, he was also a pioneer of dot and lozenge technique, where dots are placed in the middle of lozenge shaped spaces created by cross-hatching to further refine tonal shading. He was a wonderful printmaker as well. He, as I said, traveled quite a bit uh, throughout Italy. And here is a very famous uh, print of his, of a Farnese Hercules, which is a Hellenistic sculpture right here. It seems to have come from the 3rd century AD, signed by one um, Glicon, but Nothing else came uh, from his hand, so we don't know who that Glycon is. It looks as if it's done after Lysippus, who was a very famous sculptor of the 4th century BC and sculpted athletes, great, 
big athletes, as you can see here. This is Goldsuss's take on it. He is painting him from the back and give us a couple of observers just to arrange a scale. Now, Caravaggio's influence certainly came to the Netherlands. And uh, between, uh, between Goldsuss and uh, Bürgen, those two probably were the most impressive Italianists so to speak, in Holland, and they both of them belong to the Utrecht school. And here, of course, we see the doubting Thomas that, uh, that Terbergen did after Caravaggio. This is our Caravaggio from 1602, and Terbergen, in fact, uh, uh, early in the century as well. In fact, I, he may have even met Caravaggio. He may have gone to Italy in time to meet Caravaggio. And uh, here are the, uh, the two images. Now the faces here are quite northern, they're not really Italian faces. But the idea is the same. Very dramatically lit space within the figures. All the other space goes nowhere. And there's that mysterious moment that's brought to our attention of a miracle superseding the resistance of reason. And this is what happens. He, uh, here's Thomas who literally sticks his finger into the wound just as he does with uh, Caravaggio. And that influence, as I said, will be strong. Also Terbergen, right here, uh, shows us Christ before High Priest. And I must say that Terbergen did these experiments with light, light in space, the atmosphere. In fact, before, uh, before Georges de la Tour, so it's before even Rembrandt actually. So it's possible that, um, that he was first to do so. And uh, uh, here is Christ before the high priest and the most important, of course, object here is actually the candle. That divides, that divides the one group from the other group. And Christ is standing there, calmly looking at the high priest while the high priest is attempting to impress upon him uh, with his gestures uh, how wrong he is, uh, while Christ answers only with his, uh, with his glance, which is so much the stronger as represented in this painting. Then the high priest's gesture together with the book. Uh, as you see, 1620, uh, Rembrandt painted his Supper at the Mouse in 1628, so it's possible that, um, that he uh, saw the other men's experiments and adopted them uh, to his own usage. Here's Terbergen, here is Christ uh, at Emmaus, still another Terbergen. Uh, and this is a boy with a wine glass where, of course, the painter experiments again with the candlelight and uh, not only its reflection and cast shadow, but also the diffusion of light. As you see here, through the glass with the red wine, and we only see ever so little of the candle as we look at the, um, at the painting. Another delightful uh, painting is the uh, uh, Mary Flea Hunt. Uh, we see a prostitute who is catching fleas from her body with the help of her maids, perhaps. And uh, now this was done in 25. Now, as you see, uh, Georges de la Tour did something very similar within, uh, within a decade, really, less than a decade, which is why it's possible that uh, he, too, looked at Terbergen's um, art. So these are the Caravagist influences in Holland. But what is happening now is that because uh, all the traditional uh, sources of commission no longer exist in Holland, the churches don't commission art, there's no hereditary aristocracy to commission art. As I said, the Prince of Orange, who is mostly a, a military leader, 
he uh, he can always go to Italy or to someone to the Caravaggisti to order his great pieces of art. But a fascinating thing happened. Uh, the uh, by this time, by towards the middle of the 17th century, Holland had become very very wealthy. It had built a tremendous fleet and that fleet well went all around the world and even when they will lose the new Amsterdam they will still have a number of, uh, of outer trading posts in the Spice Islands and in the Far East in general and of course their fleet will always support that and a great deal of remarkable wealth came to Holland and uh, and rose the level of wealth of the middle classes and suddenly everybody wants pictures uh, they want they do not want religious pictures for the most part they certainly want their portraits but they also want uh, to see their own lives they want uh, they don't want to see themselves as uh, what they are, whether they are burghers or whether they are peasants or whether they are shoemakers. They don't want that. They don't want to see labor. They want to see themselves having a great time. That's one thing. They also want to see their countryside. They want to see beautiful, beautiful landscapes. So between the genre painting and this one, of course, belongs to the type of genre painting, which is everyday life and the seascapes. Uh, there developed an incredible um, situation which really could only be comparable, say, to mid-5th century Athens, uh, BC, or 15th century Florence. And a great number of painters occurred, and they were all of wonderful capability. Uh, and so the level was very, very high. Uh, at the end, of course, the likes of Rembrandt or Franz Holz or Jan Vermeer will uh, emerge as the best of them. But at the time this was happening, they were not necessarily the best. They were not perceived as the best, even though the likes, of course, of uh, Rembrandt at first was extremely successful. And now, we go to landscapes and waterscapes and seascapes and cowscapes and skatingscapes. And that is what, uh, what these people wanted. And for the most part, these paintings are a small size, the size that would fit into their dwellings. And they certainly did not live in palaces. And uh, as I said, everybody wanted, uh, wanted art, whether one is a cobbler or a hat maker or a humble peasant, it's just everybody wanted art. And, uh, and art appeared to satisfy their tastes. Landscapes were very important. And here we have uh, one such landscape by Hercule uh, Sigueres and View of Renan. And what immediately strikes us is the scale of uh, of the sky to the land. In this case, the land is about one third, perhaps even, yeah, one third of uh, the canvas. And well, the, uh, they, of course, they live on the sea and they're very interested in the sea since they, in fact, fought with the sea to have their land. And the sea is always there to threaten, to, to overflow the land. But they're also interested in this, um, in this remarkable, uh, remarkable atmosphere, the, uh, the sky, the clouds, as, um, as it covers the land. And as we see, this will be quite typical. Uh, even the colors are not really that interesting to them. What they want to see is this immensity, immensity of atmosphere, the light, the space, the correlation between them. And only at certain points do we see we see a windmill and a church piercing the sky. Uh, the composition is lovely because it's this, as I said, immensity. And then the church is just slightly off the center. Still another, still another, another. And people here, in fact, uh, they're not set there to give significance to the landscape, as was the case with Claude Lorraine. They're here actually to give us the scale, and uh, here are the human beings that, who are giving us the scale.
Segers also was um, a great printmaker, and uh, and his prints are uh, in many museums. And uh, when you look at the pine tree or or here the landscape with fir. It gives a whole different dimension to the landscape. Yes, there's a great deal of atmosphere and uh, the, uh, the rocky promontory here, but then over all this, uh, th there's this fur that's dominating the landscape. And uh, <clears throat> one immediately thinks of uh, almost of monsters. And at that time, the Thirty Year War is still going on, and it was a horrific war one of the worst in human history in terms of desolation and when one looks at uh, the pine tree here or the spur it almost looks like as if danger is hanging over this spectacular landscape. One of the uh, greatest landscape painters uh, in Holland will be Jacob von Rusdael and this is his view of Harlem. As you see in this case, the land is really just about one quarter, even less than one third, one quarter of the landscape. We seem to be standing on a uh, on, on raised promontory again. Uh, we see a church, the main church in Harlem. Even the birds are flying very, very high. Uh, he is as interested in cloud formation as he is in the land. And then he gives us these strips of um, of fields that that set our understanding of the scale of landscape and uh, and of the planes of the landscape here and there and there's linen being bleached in the foreground and tiny tiny people who are working their land again all of that done for scale there's almost a religious immensity in all that, uh, the meeting of man and God, and man naturally is very small, whereas God is all this incredible immensity. Even the buildings that man builds in order to meet uh, his maker uh, are incomparable to the atmosphere, to the divine creation. Uh, he. Rusdael will, in fact, become deeper and deeper in his landscapes. And here's a very famous one, and it's called the Jewish Cemetery. And what he portrays here is a ruined monastery. And just as in England, the dissolution of monasteries by uh, Henry VIII as a result of Protestantism, so here too, not only so is the case in Holland, not only the churches are denuded, but some of the monasteries are destroyed. And here we see one such destroyed monastery. And then uh, there is a Jewish cemetery right here in the foreground. Again, we see a couple of people barely visible, but they are given to us for scale, a gnarled tree on one side, but the rainbow on the other. Many Jews, after they were ex expelled from Spain in 1492, did come to Amsterdam and, uh, and were welcomed and established the community and, and of course had their own cemetery. And, uh, and this is what Rusdael uh, portrays. There are sarcophagi right there, two more on the other side, another gnarled tree that bridges the fast river. Another sarcophagus seems to be opened, in fact. The whole thing, in fact, seems abandoned. And, uh, but the rainbow on, uh, on the right bespeaks of hope and bespeaks of happiness and, um, and a good future. But uh, the melancholy of the place is very, very apparent and very obvious. One of uh, the loveliest pieces uh, at the time was this Avenue of Trees by um, Maedert Hobema. He didn't paint much and uh, what he did paint earlier would be uh, sort of wild woodlands and which frankly seemed to be a little monotonous. 
But then, uh, towards the end of his career, not his life, because uh, he, he became uh, a tax collector and made enough money so he didn't have to bother with painting anymore. But towards the end of his painting career, he painted this uh, avenue of trees that, uh, that have such an incredible, almost sort of Nicolas Poussin, uh, classical effect, uh, rational effect. They almost look like uh, Bernini columns in a way, in this, on this humble, very, very rustic road. And again, we see just a little human figure in the middle of the, uh, of the road that gives us scale. Again, the landscape is dropped down to about one-fourth of the painting with the immensity of the sky. But in this case, this immensity is now pierced by this colonnade of uh, lovely trees. And, uh, I mean, these views of the cities, the, interestingly, they weren't really very, very common, but, um, but I'm showing you what they have, because they are very lovely. And in this case, this is Zayas van Velde, and he is showing us the view of uh, Zirigzi, which is a town, Zirigzi. And here he now combines water and uh, atmosphere together. It's not enough for him to show these dispersed, lovely, diffused, really, clouds, but he also reflects them in the river. And then uh, in the background we see very naturalistic looking. It's almost as if these painters, uh, when they looked at the scene, brought a telescope with them, and the telescope was invented by that time. But we must remember that all of these were still very much painted in a studio. So they would go out and they would make sketches, and perhaps even, uh, even uh, quick oil sketches or quick uh, water, watercolor sketches. And then they will come to the studio and compose the painting, uh, keeping, of course, trying to keep the arrangement as uh, it was in nature, but at the same time exercising artistic license where they wished to do so. And uh, this is the main cathedral, of course, again springing up. And some churches, the birds are flying very, very high. A mill, a mill here. And the people who are much closer now to the painter, or to us for that matter, so as to give us perspective across the river. Uh, it's interesting to compare that with um, with Jan Vermeer, and we'll talk about Vermeer, of course, uh, further, who was um, not much known about, uh, about his life. Uh, we do know that when he died fairly young, uh, in his 40s, I think, early 40s, he, he left a wife and something like 11 children, all deep in debt. And just as with all these artists, he could not support himself by painting, so he tried his hand at dealing, at art dealing, at art evaluating. Those became uh, very common professions for artists, but still could not uh, make do. Uh, everybody will pretty much forget about him until the 19th century, when he will reappear, he will be rediscovered in the 19th century as one of the greatest of these so-called little masters. And he was from Delft, and here he is showing us the city of Delft, again, under this immensity of uh, cloud formations. And these do indeed look as if they're taken from, uh, um, from the, the looked at from a telescope, uh, with some Dutch women and men here on this shore. You can see uh, the, uh, the close-up. It also seems that um, Vermeer used, used the so-called camera obscura, which uh, was uh, a large box where one can walk in and uh, with an opening, not necessarily with a lens, and through the opening came uh, the image that will turn upside down on the opposite wall, and then mirrors would have to be used to turn it back to its normal representation. And it seems that in this case, in the case of Camera Obscura, uh, the, the, the white light turns into little dots very often, 
And we see those dots in Vermeer a lot. Uh, some uh, art historians call it pointillism, the early pointillism. I mean, all of this is composed of dots. There are dots here, dots there, a lot of dots. Uh, but you see the degree of naturalism with which uh, the whole view is, um, is painted. It is, it is quite remarkable. And here you can compare the two. This was done in, um, in 1615, and this is done after peace has, uh, has now come uh, to Holland. Holland has now recognized the, uh, the cities of very, very wealthy uh, 17th century. Holland was, as I said, very wealthy and uh, very commercial. And it seems that uh, some of these painters specialized say uh, some painters specialized in seascapes, others specialized in landscapes, and then uh, skating uh, themes or river going. So they all specialized, and uh, whoever was better at what. And, uh, and, and thus they were also promoting their wares. Whoever liked, liked landscapes went to landscape painters, and uh, whoever liked uh, skating, uh, scenes like this went to uh, De Velde, etc. So this is uh, lovely and it's winter now, of course it's uh, very cold and these rivers do ice up and that's when everybody puts their s skates on and travels by skates as you see here. Um, these very kind of romantic looking building of red brick uh, people walking around, skating together, as if, I mean, life continues, uh, nothing changes. Uh, what he does here, the landscape, about half a landscape, drops down compared to the atmosphere, but then in the foreground he also paints the, um, the buildings themselves. And, and then the cranes, the ubiquitous cranes in Holland, in commercial Holland that picked up the merchandise when the uh, river is not frozen and of course lifted it to warehouses. Still another Albert uh, Koop uh, who painted cows and uh, we see the same thing. It's clearly it's a very shallow uh, river here where cows can easily walk around uh, a hill on the right to people on the left uh, the immensity of the sky. I mean, all these things are they're similar, but but also different. It's uh, it's sort of as uh, one goes through Gothic cathedrals. I mean, every Gothic cathedral is very different, but the uh, the basic idea of a French Gothic could be similar. Or uh, Russian icons, they all appear to be very similar, but they actually do differ. This is what the taste was. And uh, now we go to Vanitas still lives, another type of. Uh, of painting that was very popular in Holland. And uh, this is a typical example of Vanitas, the sort of the moralistic tale paintings, where one is invited to contemplate on one's uh, mortality at in Arcadia ego sort of thing. And uh, even in Arcadia there is death. And uh, a number of them, of course, have human skulls. And there's a book, uh, some philosophical some philosophical writing uh, that contemplates perhaps on the same um, ideas. But what's, al what's also very important here is the painter's incredible ability to portray light and to portray different surfaces. In this case, we see that light comes from the left, the glass is overturned, and we see the window reflecting twice in the glass there. It also reflects in the, uh, at the stem of the glass in, uh, in crockery right here, reflects differently from the skull. It's more opaque, of course, and differently still from the book and a quill. In these Danitas paintings, uh, things usually are overturned and uh, and, and somewhat uh, irregular, as, as it is here, for instance. Uh, here is the still life that we see, and the table is laden with food. I mean, there's butter and, of course, bread, some exotic fruit, 
and uh, another piece of bread that's eaten, almost eaten by mice. In other words, nothing is perfect here. Everything one must think of uh, the imperfection of life and thus the vanity of life, even while one is blessed with all good things of life. Here, William uh, Class Hedda was really a specialist in this sort of vanitas painting. And here we see, I mean, he was an absolute uh, master of conveying light's reflection from different surfaces, whether it's bright, whether it's uh, opaque, whether it's penetrating, whether it's diffusing, depending on the surface against which it falls. And here's a table laden with exotic things. There's this enormous crab, and then lemons, of course, were brought from, uh, from other countries and thus expensive, but the idea of a peeled lemon appears throughout. Uh, here are just wrinkled cloths negligibly thrown around a, a, a leather box, another lemon, piece of bread, spectacular silver pot right here, and another one of those uh, beautiful Dutch glasses. And here too we see a reflection of windows. And here too we know that the light comes from the left. With this whole idea of a light coming from a window and lighting up objects as if in the process of creation, really separating light from dark. This is what is so striking about these uh, paintings, in addition, of course, to the absolutely exquisite skill with which everything is portrayed. Still another one by him, and uh, another lemon, of course, that spilled these beautiful goblets, an overturned cup right here, sort of like a Greek kilix, and then of course oysters uh, that uh, the two are expensive, one glass in fact is broken. Uh, so even though we don't have a skull here, but we do see that all luxuries of life end in the end. Then something else uh, happened in Holland uh, towards the middle of the 17th century, and that was a tulip craze. Uh, tulips that grew wild in Anatolia first began to be cultivated uh, by uh, the Ottomans and then through the Ottomans they were introduced to Europe. Everybody loved them, the Dutch absolutely loved them and at some point uh, a tulip bulb here, according to the 19th century Scottish journalist, single Semper Augustus, this is Semper Augustus, these absolutely spectacular tulips with different colors. Um, sold for 5,500 florins, also known as Dutch guilders, in 1633. Now, to give us a scale, by 1636 it had become difficult to obtain one of these bulbs in exchange for seven acres of land. Another scale is, at that time, the cost of one ox was 100 florins and a pig was 30 florins. One bulb of this was 5,500 florins. No one could explain why a monochrome tulip suddenly would spring into polychrome. And as turned out later, there was some sort of a disease, in fact, uh, that was introduced uh, into the tulips that made it happen. So the tulips that sprung into polychrome were actually diseased, but nobody knew about it at the time, and they became extremely expensive, uh, over the top. Uh, in fact, uh, young Bruegel the Younger, who was the grandson of the famous Bruegel of the 16th century, he uh, uh, drew this satire on the tulip mania and introduced monkeys uh, as replacements for, for human beings, and here they are feasting, not realizing that the bubble is going to burst any time. Uh, and here, of course, is the flower bed full of these magnificent flowers. Uh, another monkey who is supposedly a gentleman because he has a sword. He is reading off the list, probably the prices of the tulips, 
and then we go to the left and then at this point the bubble bust and so we have some of them wiping their eyes in despair in the background somebody is getting buried perhaps uh, uh, killing oneself for losing all all one's fortune this whole uh, tulip mania as it came to be called was uh, was taken very very seriously in Holland and um, now we go to genre painting and uh, genre painting is the uh, painting of everyday life and then and of course uh, the Dutch delighted in mocking the Catholic Church and here we see one of uh, such examples where monks and nuns engage in a very unholy communion in this case. The uh, one of the greatest uh, painters at the time among among so many who were all very very skilled was uh, Adrian Brower and what he loved to do was to portray the uh, the life of uh, of the beer halls and the life of uh, brothels and uh, the behavior of people in those circumstances, as you see here. Uh, here's a typical one that shows you the, the smokers. Uh, his brush is very fast and, uh, and very precise at the same time. He really catches the movement. It's, he has this sense of immediacy. His execution is spectacular. And here are some men who are sitting around smoking, having an absolutely great time. Uh, there is one on the side that, who seems to just be blowing his nose, in fact, not very elegant. Uh, there are various diagonals that cut through the paintings, to in a very sort of Baroque style. Here's one, of course, the arms, the colors. Everyone is, uh, is enjoying himself, and that's what, uh, what this particular painter liked to represent. On the other geometrically other side of that is Peter de Hoog and here he shows a very proper extremely clean Dutch interior where the uh, proprietress uh, and her maid are counting this impeccably bleached linen you can almost smell the cleanliness it's 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 in the air the scene is lit up from the door this time it seems we, we catch just a glimpse of the outdoors, otherwise it's light. And again, the arrangement of light, of space, of behavior of light, the atmosphere, all of that is very important, but stillness rules, cleanliness rules, unlike something like this, of course. Jan Steen was uh, so, a little bit like our previous painter and the very opposite of, uh, of the hook. In this lecture we're going up and down, up and down from very proper households then to the tavern, that proper household then to the tavern again. And here, this is not a tavern, this is a kitchen it seems. It almost seems it's the same proprietress, look, she's wearing the same, uh, the same outfit but then uh, this was common, people wore the same clothes very similar clothes because that was the fashion. So this proprietor said, and she seems to have fallen asleep and while she's asleep everything is upside down and it's called world upside down. And here we have a pig and, uh, and a duck and uh, there is a dog right there little children all over the place, a wine jug or a beer jug that's just spilled its contents on the floor, the required lemon right there, peeled lemon with a peel hanging down, and uh, the maid, is that the same maid? Well, perhaps, we don't know, it almost looks as if this is a parody of the other painting. Let's see, the other painting, yes, and they're in fact done in the same year. Uh, the maid here is sassy and uh, she has uh, her admirer who had put very sort of proprietary leg on her knee, not that, uh, not that she minds. Not only she doesn't mind, but she is uh, negligibly offering him more drink, it seems. Uh, there is someone plays a fiddle, uh, 
an old man attempting to read, and nobody pays attention to him, an older woman who is attempting to reprimand someone, no one is paying any attention to her either. Uh, but all of that is done with such vivacity and such good humor and such joie de vivre, such love of life. It's uh, hard not to like them. In fact, uh, would you rather have something like this on your wall? I mean, not the worst thing, of course. Uh, or this. Uh, this is just more entertaining. Light again comes from the window. Up they go to another brilliant Dutch interior. Again, very, very clean, very geometric. And these painters use the tiles on the uh, floor to show the geometry, to, to show spatial arrangement. And uh, the, uh, the combination of light and atmosphere and space is really, it's really almost classical. So rational, so well arranged, so harmonious, and as if to uh, Underline the harmony, there is a young girl playing on, uh, on the virginal, uh, very, very tall windows, and apparently there are windows obviously in every room, and from these windows, these brilliant shadows uh, are thrown on the floor. One almost thinks of Modrian uh, when one looks at these, of course later in the 20th century, this geometric arrangement of different colors that convey rationality, cleanliness, mathematics, measurement, um, just very delightful. And then back to Vermeer. As I said, uh, we don't have too many paintings from him, maybe 35 that definitely are by him. There was a very famous forger once in the, in the 20th century, uh, but, um, but then he was discovered. So back to Vermeer, in most of the cases, yes, very, very quiet interior, light comes from the left, and uh, this, this remarkable uh, virtuoso cleanliness of vision, and not only cleanliness of naturalistic vision, but almost psychological vision as well. Here, it's almost as if we are peeking in, it's not uh, clear vision, we are a visitor and we're a visitor uninvited. It seems that we have imposed ourselves and, and are, as a result, privy to things we shouldn't be seeing. This is called a letter, otherwise it's also called a love letter. And here sits a lady of the house, and her maid seems to have just brought her the letter, and the proprietress looks above to, uh, to the maid who seems to be keeping her secrets, because she has this little uh, smile on her lips. Behind we see a painting, one of those seascape paintings, and it almost appears as if the letter came from overseas or from the one who travels. And the, even the look on the, on the woman's face is, is that of uncertainty, expectation, uh, a question mark, should I, end, should I open, should I not open? Black tile again. Uh, we see a cupboard here and a broom, so everything is very, very clean. And uh, both the maid and uh, the proprietress are described with um, remarkable singularity of observation. Something similar, this time a lady writing a letter. Let's see, this is 65. This is 70, uh, perhaps the traveler had traveled for five years and they're still corresponding. And here the lady now is writing a letter while the maid is looking out the window. We don't know what's behind the window, obviously a, a cityscape. And the light, as before, comes from there. There's, a, there's an atmosphere of stillness, of uh, expectation again, of... Uh, but also of occupation in, in one's own writing here. It's a wealthy household. The Turkish rug is there, and that is always a sign of a wealthy household. And the patience of uh, a maid, 
in a classical painting in the back. So we don't know whether it's a reference to the fact that the, the woman herself may be Protestant and her lover may be Catholic. We don't know. This looks more like a Catholic painting. Uh, still another, and this one has to do with a milkmaid. Uh, the light again falls from the left. Uh, there's a hamper uh, on the side and uh, the foot warmer. Again, dots, all these dots. I mean, there's a, there's a large bulk of cheese in a basket and bread. Let's see. Yeah, here. And you can see these dots everywhere, which again uh, directs uh, our thoughts to something like the camera obscura. Uh, the maid herself is depicted very, very young. She must be, what, 15, uh, 14, perhaps. She is a sturdy Dutch girl, uh, very intent on, uh, on her occupation, just as intent on her occupation as uh, the lady here is intent on her own. Uh, obviously, this is the kitchen, so there are no paintings on the wall, and uh, things are kind of, well, humble, of course. But the jar there is beautiful, and uh, so is the basket that's uh, hanging there. And, and the colors are different. The colors are much brighter, these uh, very ultramarine blues, and the lovely yellow, and the white, all seems to come forth as opposed to more somber, darker colors. Here, the colors just jump at you. My favorite person is the uh, uh, geographer. He is actually a companion piece to another one called the astronomer. And this, of course, is the age of exploration. And uh, as a result, he has uh, a globe there. The companion piece has a celestial globe. And the man is wearing sort of like a Japanese uh, kimono, which at that time became fashionable to wear as a house robe. And that's what he's wearing. He is intent again on what he is doing. A spectacular rug is on the table and again described every wrinkle, every, every fold is described on the rug and the design of the rug follows the fold and he is he's holding a compass in his uh, hands, the measuring instrument and he is all involved in his occupation. The maps of discovery on his walls and as before we see the light falling from the left and his face is almost slightly blurred it's almost as if he's in a movement of doing something it's he's rising or he's bending and now we go to Portugal this is how it all began in Amsterdam with the military companies and uh, if you go there in Amsterdam, or Holland in general, and uh, go to their museums, you'll see many, many of these. Uh, these men, the, you can see them all uh, uh, equally. They all paid the same amount of money to have their portrait taken. And this is the group portrait of pilgrims of the Knightly Brotherhood of the Holy Land in Harlem. So presumably these are men who actually had gone on pilgrimage to the Holy Land and came back. Uh, earlier on, while the wars went on, these military companies were, of course, very important for the protection of uh, the land. Later on, they will become more or less social groups. But here it is, and uh, they love these because, obviously, of course, everybody can see oneself. Franz Holz, who is one of the, uh, the great three of uh, Holland in the 17th century, so Rembrandt number one, then Franz Holz and then Vermeer, but then between Holz and Vermeer, they're so very different that it's difficult to prioritize them. He began as a portrait painter and God had given him this, this tempestuous ability for a thunderstorm uh, type of painting. He, it almost seems that uh, the spontaneity with which he painted. It almost seems as if the brush was jumping out of his hand as he painted. Uh, meanwhile, picking up every detail of light, every de detail of shade, every detail of character. And uh, with him, uh, group portraits have changed, as you see here. This is the banquet of the officers of St. George Civic Guard. Now, these banquets could last, uh, could last easily a couple of weeks. In fact, it seems that the authorities had appealed to these companies 
to please reduce them to maximum three days. And here they all are. And each face is carefully described, but also as opposed to the rigidity of the traditional group portraits such as this. Here there is the, uh, the air of conviviality, the air of ease, the air of having consumed uh, plenty of uh, alcoholic beverage, the air of being very happy with themselves. And never mind pilgrimage to the Holy Land, we are very, very happy here. The painting is slashed with diagonals, whether it's uh, the standards or, or, of course, the ribbons of the knights. All of them are wearing their best, they're all wearing these incredible uh, uh, ruffles. Uh, they're middle-aged, they're not necessarily young, and they're just having a great time and they certainly got themselves the best painter to, uh, to do the job. Now, we must understand that he does not paint them all together as a group, even though it very much appears so, because it's so much it appears as if he just sits there and very naturally depicts every man. No, every man was depicted separately. And then he composed the painting in his studio, combining all the chess pieces on uh, one one canvas. Towards the end of his life, Franz Holz by this time is about um, 80 years old, and this is when he paints the, uh, the women now, the, the regents or the board members of the old men's almshouse. Now, Franz Holz himself, uh, well, he's not wealthy and uh, he doesn't have great family life because uh, his children, uh, one of them, one of them end, ended up, I think, in a mental sanatorium and there was something with the other child as well. But he knows the difficulties of life and he recognizes the, the signs of, um, of age and the signs of care in these old women. It's done almost entirely in black and white with some tones of grey. Uh, and uh, it is the women's faces that, uh, that are starkly portrayed. And yet, I mean, obviously they're not beautiful women anymore. And uh, their cares are great because they want to take care of uh, humanity as old as themselves, but less fortunate and uh, as a result having to be in the almshouse. Here, just to show you the comparison by another, uh, by another painter who did a similar thing here, and these are the two paintings together. Uh, the whole idea of this darkness, the whole idea of doing it in the, uh, in the uh, blacks and whites and the grays uh, gives profundity to the painting, far more so than in this case, even though the faces here are also very carefully described, but they are placed against the light background and with our ubiquitous window on the left, and as such, give, uh, give an impression of a happier home, which it may not be, in fact, whereas this perhaps looks more realistic. Uh, he was absolutely brilliant, Franz Holz, with his uh, with this tempestuous uh, brush of his. And, and one of the great portraits is the so-called Laughing Cavalier. He's got his arm into our space, so a Kimbo right here. His elbow protrudes and he's dressed in this spectacular outfit. His garment, it has uh, bees and arrows and cupids and bees. It almost uh, looks amorous in a way and then he pretty much, uh, he looks pretty dangerous. He looks uh, somewhat amorous. Uh, I mean, look at the very dangerous moustaches and the head and the hat that uh, sits at an angle on his um, on his head and isn't he pleased with himself. So this is what Holes was absolutely very remarkable at uh, and that is the catching of the moment, the catching of the mood, the catching, the, the, the employing, uh, the spontaneous brush strokes of his to give us the impression of reality and in fact much more than reality. A lot more of it is intention behind reality. Same thing with the Gypsy Girl. And uh, there she is, she, she might be in one of the taverns and having a good time. Her, her cut is very low and that also could be very suggestive. And, uh, but she too is uh, having a lovely time. Now, uh, let's see, 24 
he painted the Cavalier, and 11 years later he painted the Gypsy Girl, but it almost looks as the Cavalier is looking at the girl, and the girl is looking kind of askance at the Cavalier, contemplating um, her advantages. Um, still another uh, brilliant portrait, and that is uh, the witch, well, she came to be called the Witch of Harlem. It seems there was such a person, and uh, she's called Mal uh, Bab, and Mal means something, some, someone who's mad. And uh, there, there she is. She has clearly consumed all the contents of this beer job, and she's laughing. Seems happily, happily slash madly, and uh, an owl on uh, uh, on her shoulder represents we don't know what. Uh, it seems that um, there's an expression that the wisest of all are fools and children, and wisdom is uh, often allegorized by Minerva with her owl. So whether this was the case, we don't know. But there seems to be a woman uh, like that who, in fact, then lived in one of those almshouses. But she, too, is conveyed with these very, very fast brush strokes. She, too, is uh, wearing a ruffle, and but the ruffle is, uh, is shown with the immediacy of the woman's laughter. And thus we have come to the end of uh, our lecture on the so-called Little Dutchmen. And some of them were bigger than others, but the majority of them, as I said, possessed extraordinary skill and they produced an incredible amount of art in the 17th century. And that art indeed could be seen in many museums and uh, it deals with human lives. It doesn't deal so much with allegories or crucifixions uh, or the life of saints or the life of classical heroes. It deals with the life around these painters and it deals with their happiness and their pain and uh, and their likes and dislikes and they are absolutely delightful. Thank you very much. I'll see you next time.